So are you suggesting that there's a potential that this is just RNA that our bodies create naturally and we are locking everybody down, putting masks on them for something that just simply may exist inside of them by nature? Yes, yeah, that's essentially exactly what I'm suggesting. And, you know, when, when our bodies are exposed to some kind of insult, right, even if you just get a little laceration, there's a response. Our bodies make certain uh, antibodies, proteins, our, our cells mobilize to respond to make sure that, you know, nothing dangerous has invaded the integrity of our bodies. And I think that um, we could simply be measuring some response like that that's very nonspecific. And there's really no way to tell what this test is measuring, because if you look at the RNA test, it's, we don't know the source of the RNA, and there's no gold standard to compare it to, so there's no known error rate, and you can't calculate one. The antibody test is even less specific, and even the FDA in their guidance about the antibody tests said that they should not be used for diagnosis. And with the PCR test, the CDC, as well as the manufacturers in their package insert say that the test should not be used for diagnosis. So what I think is essentially happening is that the more tests we conduct, the more positives we're going to have. And then the media is reporting an increase in the number of cases just based on these testing results without any need even for clinical information, like whether someone is sick or not. Let me ask you this question. You know, we're calling it SARS-CoV-2, which means that it apparently is, is extremely similar to the SARS coronavirus that was extremely deadly, did not do nearly the damage that was expected. Uh, what is the science behind connecting it to SARS? Is it identical to SARS? I mean, I hear that the only difference is maybe just a slight spike protein. Uh, have they determined that this really is just another SARS coronavirus? Well, I want to first say that the original SARS virus wasn't isolated either, and they used the same exact uh, procedures in that. So you have to really question the basis of comparison to something that wasn't clearly proven in origin in the first place. Right. But what they say is, based on a fragment, once again, a fragment or a few fragments of RNA, that there was an 84% sequence identity. Therefore, it's the same or a relate, closely related virus. But I'll tell you, if you look at the sequence identity between humans and chimpanzees, a totally different species, we have 96% sequence identity, much higher than the, the identity between these two alleged viruses. Wow. So I don't really understand how they could even relate them based on such a low percentage of sequence identity. Nine days ago, I opened an intensive care unit to care for the sickest COVID positive patients in this city. In these nine days, I have seen things I have never seen before. In treating these patients, I have witnessed medical phenomenon that just don't make sense in the context of treating a disease that is supposed to be a viral pneumonia. COVID-19 lung disease, as far as I can see, is not a pneumonia and should not be treated as one. It appears as some kind of viral induced disease, most resembling high altitude sickness. I have seen patients dependent on oxygen take off their oxygen and quickly progress through a state of anxiety and emotional distress and eventually get blue in the face. And while they look like patients absolutely on the brink of death, they do not look like patients dying of pneumonia. The patients I'm seeing in front of me uh, look most like as if a person was dropped off on the top of Mount Everest without time to acclimate. Uh, I don't know the final answer of this disease but I'm quite sure that a ventilator is not it. All right, so I, I think this video that, that Kyle Seidel put out led to a, a sort of shift, at least, in the protocols in hospitals. The NIH ended up saying we need to back away from ventilators, maybe move into giving people oxygen, which seems like that should have been a no-brainer from the beginning. We know that those ventilators killed 9 out of 10 people, and that's something that I've spoken out about. Uh, we've had scientists, I believe that hydroxychloroquine should be under much uh, uh, more consideration because of the successful trials uh, that have been all over the world. But what it points to and what I want to sort of challenge you with is Kyle Seidel is talking about a very specific set of symptoms that he has never seen before, yet is seeing it you know, in congruency amongst multiple patients. And he's reaching out to the doctors around the world saying, I know you're seeing this same anomaly too. 
And once I think in, I don't think we've seen the full adjustment, but it does appear as doctors adjust to seeing this more as a blood illness than maybe a respiratory illness. So we, we've talked about the heme and how SARS-CoV-2 uh, appears to be attaching to red blood cells. All of this to me sounds like a very specific illness that true only is really having this you know, mortal or acute effect on about, I think, 0.26% of the population. But how do you explain that from your perspective when there's such congruity with whatever this is and how people that are having acute reaction are reacting to it? Right. Well, there's uh, many things to consider. I, I think the most important thing to realize is that, um, at least in the United States, uh, doctors have been prevented from sending these patients for autopsy. If we were able to autopsy these patients, then we would know really what was the cause of death. Um, there is some data from Italy where they did a series of autopsies and they found a lot of blood clots in the lungs. And uh, so in other words, a pulmonary embolism. And this is generally not caused by viruses. It has many causes, but sedating people and putting them on a ventilator could certainly cause uh, blood clots in the lung. And that could cause problems with oxygenation that could lead to the symptoms that were described. There's also, you know, many, many other possibilities. Like one thing that just came right into my mind when I first heard uh, that video that you just played was that it sounds like cyanide poisoning. But of course, you know, I don't know if anyone's looked into that or if they did any tests uh, to, that would confirm that. I'm um, not sure of the data. There was no, see, when something like this happens that is an anomaly during a health crisis, what it should um, lead to is a major investigation where anyone that dies in that suspicious way or has those suspicious symptoms, if they do die, they should be autopsied. There should be investigators from public health agencies that should be coming in to try and figure out what's going on there. But there was no such effort that I'm aware of of it all. And it seems like Dr. Seidel was pretty much silenced. Like I heard that he was taken off the ICU duty. And uh, certainly we haven't heard any more from him uh, that I'm aware of anyway since that time. So I think this is still really somewhat mysterious as to what causes it. But as he described, it is not the typical viral pneumonia, which is what they described in the original patients in Wuhan and in many other clinical reports. Whatever it is, do you think we're having a shared experience across the world, though? Do you believe whether this is RNA that comes in from inside of us? Is this RNA that is having an ill effect on a certain population, but it's similar around the world? Or do you think we are just sort of grabbing different... I mean, we know that there's a lot of comorbidities directly involved, whether it's heart disease, COPD, diabetes. They keep sort of shifting this list. and. I think, I, I think I heard the CDC may have, you know, whatever. It, it keeps changing. Uh, do you believe that there, whatever it is, that there's a similarity to it around the world? Or do you think we're just sort of lumping in a bunch of different ailments and, and making it into a disease? Yeah, well, I, I think that there, there is some similarity because I think um, most of the deaths are actually a direct result or an indirect result of these lockdown type of policies that we've seen around the world. Right. Because, you know, this happened, you know, very suddenly in a heartbeat right after the World Health Organization announced the pandemic status. And suddenly you have people, you know, that are out of work. Right. They're they're told to stay home and lock themselves in. They're put in this state of intense fear, which has a lot of deleterious effects on, on our physical and mental aspects of our life. And then they also are basically prohibited from accessing health care. So like here's one thing that's really underreported and there's no certain statistics, but there is a one study that looks at this indirectly that shows that between one and two percent of all presentations to the emergency department in the United States are due to low blood sugar from diabetes medications. So if you're suddenly put in a fear state, locked in your house, your activities change, and you can't access your doctor, like you're going to have different eating habits, different activities, so your insulin or other requirements for those medications are going to change, and people were afraid to go to the ER in an emergency, even with heart attacks and things like that, because they thought they would get this virus and die. 
So I think a lot of it is just from not having access to that type of care and people simply got very sick and died in their home.